Amen. Amen. Psalm 116. So if you'll indulge me tonight, this was actually part of an assignment I had earlier in the year in seminary to go through and do some translating of, of Hebrew into English. And it was a wonderful class, a few classes, learning the language that most of the, the scriptures written in. The Old Testament is written in predominantly Hebrew, as you know. And so there are some phrases in there that are just so much better stated in the Hebrew than we can capture in English. So I'm going to do my best to try to give you some of those nuggets tonight. Um, and as we do that, I did want to let you know that um, in Hebrew poetry, um, the concepts are more the point than the rhymes or the meter, like we're used to in, in English poetry, roses are red, violets are blue. You know, there's this meter and rhyme that we kind of get used to hearing in traditional English poetry. In Hebrew poetry, it's different. You'll never find rhymes and rarely find meter. And what their poetry is built on is concepts woven together and, and wordplay to kind of bat concepts off each other, almost like a ping pong. And they do this through various uh, different literary devices. But you'll see tonight that um, in that um, wordplay, there's some powerful truth for us. And I hope to point that out in a few of these verses for you tonight. Psalms 113 through 118 and then 136 are all part of the Seder Psalms. They're all part of the traditional passages read every year at the Seder uh, for uh, generations now. And when the Jewish people gather every year, once a year, to celebrate the Passover and commemorate it as the Lord commanded them to. These passages are part of that celebration, and they each have a specific role and timing in that, that service. And Psalm 116, you find toward the end of the meal after the, um, I believe it's right after the final cup, is where it's traditionally read or uh, even more often sung. And I think that's really significant because as we go through the text tonight, it is one of those psalms, right? The Passover psalms. But keep in mind, Jesus and his disciples sang this together the night that he went to Gethsemane, was betrayed, um, taken to trial, and then crucified. And so the nearness of Christ, I think, is something that we should look for as we look in these verses tonight to realize he was singing these words with his 12 disciples the night that he was betrayed, that last supper that he had with them, that intimate evening when he showed them what it was to truly be a servant. This was part of that evening. And for me, that gave some powerful context. So keep that in mind as we, as we go through these verses together. Let's start in verse 1. And I'm actually going to read the entire psalm. Can we do something? Let's stand together. And no need to read out loud, but I'm going to read it, the entire psalm, because I think it helps to get the flow of it better. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifices of, of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, 
O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Look at the very first phrase in verse 1. I love the Lord, and I'm sorry, you may be seated. (laughs) The very first phrase is, I love the Lord. The very last phrase is, praise the Lord, or more specifically, alleluia, right? And so these are the bookends to this entire chapter, and think of it that way, that everything in between weaves between these two statements of adoration to the Lord and declarations of his love. I love the Lord and praise the Lord. That's called enveloping, and everything is enveloped in between those two statements in this chapter. And so as we continue to read in verse 1, we see that there's a reason that the psalmist loves the Lord. He says, I love the Lord. Why? Because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. You'll see a theme throughout the psalm off and on where there's a lot of calling upon the name of the Lord. Crying out is more um, accurately translated. This is a desperate calling upon from the depths of his soul, crying out to, to his God, to his creator. And he's saying, when I called upon him, he answered. He has inclined his ear to me. Aren't you thankful that we have a God who hears us when we call out to him? Prayer is so powerful because it isn't going into a void. It isn't just some therapeutic practice that we go through verbally for our own psyche, right? It is communing. It is communicating with our creator. And he hears. He says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. Not just every other voice, but he has heard my voice and my supplications. He has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. It's encouraging just to be reminded sometimes that we have a voice with our Heavenly Father. We have a voice. He hears it. And not only does he hear it, but he actually inclines his ear to us. He, he bends his ear to listen. He wants to hear every word that we say. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Bold declaration from the psalmist, but how many of you could echo that? So um, I am so grateful for, as I look through here, I mean, it's humbling, honestly. The, the folks in this room have walked with Jesus the decades and decades that you have. I just think one of the things I've learned from folks like yourselves is you just get to a point where there's, there's no turning back. You know, you come too far with him. You know him too well. Um, and, and there's not even a consideration of turning back. Because like the disciples, where else would we go? And that's what he's saying, for as long as I live. This isn't some statement of hubris, but this is his pouring out his heart saying, God, you've got me for life. You've got me for life. And his grace, of course, and his mercy. But um, he has brought us too far. Right? As the old song says, wouldn't give nothing for my journey now. Right? We're, we're going to make it through to the other side with him. As long as we live, we are his and he is ours. Verse 3. The pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Let me read for you what um, my translation uh, is rendered as. The fetters of death entangled me, and the distresses of the underworld discovered me. I discovered anguish and sorrow. He's not just talking about distress. He's talking about the distresses of the underworld discovered me. And when he talks about the fetters of death, he's saying that he could feel death closing in on him very very real ways. And as I was meditating on this and and preparing, I realized there's, I think, three times in my life I could point to and say I knew the the encroaching sense of death because of being uh, pretty ill physically. And those three times, um, the Lord was very gracious and merciful and was with me and brought me through it. 
but I came close. And those three times, I just remember exactly what he described. Feeling, the feeling of death coming in, physical death, but also the distresses of the underworld because a lot of times accompanying that is this onslaught from, from the evil one and this um, just discouragement and attack from, from hell that can accompany that physical illness, right? Um, and that is the one-two punch that he's describing here. He said, I was so low physically and spiritually that I just sensed a, a darkness moving in on my body and on my mind and soul. And I'm sure many of you can uh, testify to feeling that same thing at times. And I just want to say, thank God he brings us through it. Amen. Uh, it looks, in, in those moments, it, it, it doesn't seem like you will make it through. But praise the Lord. He brings us through. He brought them through. And I, it made me stop and pray for so many patients now. And those who have loved ones who are battling serious illness with this pandemic. And realizing this is a very real verse to a lot of people. And um, imagine going through it without the Lord. You know? So it really gave me pause to pray and think of what uh, a lot of folks and maybe in our community and our loved ones are going through right now even. But he says, the fetters of death entangled me. The distresses of the underworld discovered me and I discovered anguish and sorrow. There's some of that word play. He's repeating the word discover. He's saying, something found me (laughs) and I found something. I found anguish and sorrow in that place. But... Thank God, that's not the last verse of the chapter. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Another way you could say it is, Lord, rescue my soul, I pray. What is the soul? It is the essence of your truest self. It is who you are, your deepest level of self-identity that really is only known fully to God in you. It is that inside something that makes you who you are. He said, my deepest self, rescue me. Because even that was, was um, coming under the threat of annihilation by this darkness that had come around him. Verse five, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. Now, look at what he did here. The first four verses we see kind of some declarations and then we see a description of what he's going through personally. And now all of a sudden he's kind of flipping the script and he's describing the character of our God. And he says, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. Just think of those three statements. Gracious, righteous, and merciful. That's the God whom we serve. That's the God dwelling within us. That's the God making all things new in our lives. Number one, what is he? He's gracious. If it weren't for the grace of God, we wouldn't even come to him, much less have a chance of being saved by him. But not only does he bring us to his salvation, but when he does, he's righteous. And so he makes things right in our lives that were wrong. His righteousness is imputed to us. We are clothed in it. And the righteousness of God, that character of his, is our, what we depend upon. We know that there is a standard of right, and he is that standard. And he is merciful full of mercy, loving compassion, that mercy does triumph even over judgment according to the word. And this is the nature of our God. And he's saying, this is the situation I was in, but this is the God that I was calling out to. I was calling out to. And he, he continues his description of the Almighty. He says in verse 6, The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. My rendition of that, I am guards the naive ones. When I was made small, he caused me to be saved. Have you ever felt made small? (laughs) Again, it seems appropriate for the time we're in because it seems like the entire world has been made small by recent events on every front. And he says, the Lord is with us when we acknowledge our smallness. When we admit to our complete dependency upon the sovereignty of another, that we really have no control, do we? 
He says, when we feel that lack of control and that maybe things are spinning out of control, that's the time to remember that the Lord preserves the simple, the naive ones. Um, If we learn anything with each passing year, it's that we know so little about so much, right? We realize our own naivete about so many things. And he says, that's fine. He says, you have to be a child to enter my kingdom. And not to be afraid of that humility, but actually to embrace it. Um, So the Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. I was made small, and he saved me. Verse 7, return to your rest, O my soul. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. This is a real meaningful verse because there is a phrase here that only appears this time in the entire scripture. And that's return, uh, this is my rendition, return, O my soul, to your resting place. For I am has completed what was lacking in you. He takes a moment and he speaks to his own soul and he tells it what to do. He says, soul, return. Return to your resting place. And that word resting place is the only, this is the only time that word appears in all of scripture. There's two such phrases in this chapter, which I think is pretty meaningful. And imagine again, Jesus at the Seder, the last supper, knowing what lies ahead singing this with his disciples, return, O my soul, to your resting place. For I am has completed what was lacking in you. Knowing that the completion of all that lacks in you and me was just ahead on the cross when he said, it is finished. And I love the song selection tonight when we sang, it is done, it is done. It is finished echoes from eternity past to eternity future. We will hear it again in glory with the Lord. And, and right here, he's pointing to that and saying, the Lord has completed that which is lack, what was lacking in you. And the psalmist is saying that. Think, pay attention to those tenses. He's saying, I am has completed. This is not future. He has completed. He's already done it. What was lacking in you. He said, when you return to that place of rest, which we know is is the cross, when we return to that place of rest, we understand that I am has completed everything that we lack. And sometimes we have to tell our soul to return to that awareness and understanding, not to look to our lack, our insufficiency, our weakness, our failure, our sin, not to look to the places that we wish we were different or that we could do better in this or that we feel someone else is better at that. But to look at all of that, everything that lacks within us, even the love that we wish we had for people or for for him that is lacking in some way. He says, I am has completed what was lacking. Rest, O my soul. Find your home again in the finished work of Calvary. The profoundness of understanding our identity as being complete in Christ. Read Colossians. Amen. We are complete in Christ, beloved. And when that settles deep within our soul, the things that we lack or perceive to lack, then kind of fade away in the light of his glory and grace. And we realize that it's his sufficiency all along that carries us, that is enough. It is his power all along that first of all redeemed us, secondly takes us home and does everything in between that we need done in our hearts, minds, spirit, soul, body. The completeness that we know in Jesus is something that the, he had to remind his soul of here. And I encourage you, return to your resting place. I am has completed, brothers and sisters, what was lacking in you. And if we can do anything in these days, it's to get alone with Jesus and say, thank you for making me complete. Do you remember what it was like being incomplete? Do you remember what it was like being so broken? You didn't even know where to start? You didn't even know what was what was brokenness and what was pieces anymore, did you? You didn't even know how to get this thing put back together. But he does because he completes us. Everything that's lacking. 
And verse 8, he continues, For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. He's referring to three things here, his soul, his eyes, his feet. What he's saying, that inside of me, that identity of who I am, you have delivered it. You've given me salvation in my soul forever, which we know is eternal. You've saved my soul, but you've gone further than that. And you don't only save my soul, you've saved my eyes from tears. And I was thinking about that, and and it's such a, a simple thing. When we weep, we can't see clearly. Amen? It's cleansing, it's necessary, it's needed at times. That's the only option, right? But we, still, we can't see clearly in that moment of weeping. But we remember the promise in Scripture, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And he's saying, you saved my eyes from weeping. There was a season when I couldn't even see clearly because of the pain and the grief that flooded my eyes with tears. But when that season passed... I could see clearly again because you saved my eyes from that place of not having the discernment, not having the ability to see past today, not having the ability to see past my pain or the, the issue that I was going through or the burden that weighed, on, that weighed on my heart or the broken heart that I was experiencing. Seasons of tears are very real seasons. But he's saying, you saved me from them. And he saves our feet from stumbling. From falling. Stumbling is a better translation. But we no longer fall. He's saying, you make my path straight, as his promise is in Proverbs, right? You've you've put a path before my feet. And I remember when I used to stumble and stumble and stumble. But you have brought a levelness to my path. You've brought the mountains low and you've exalted the valleys and now there's a straight plane to walk with with you, my Lord, because you have come and you have saved my feet from stumbling. And think of all the times that I I also think of this. Sometimes he saves our feet when we do stumble, (laughs) right? He saves our hide. (laughs) Messes we get ourselves in when we do stumble, which happens. But he comes in, and he, even those times that we remember we stumbled, it didn't destroy us. We faltered, but he didn't fail us. Amen? And he's saying, even the stumbling is no longer a fear, because you have saved me from that as well. Verse 9, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Now, the concept here is Freedom. And the fuller meaning from the Hebrew is, I will, it's a future statement, I will walk about before the presence of I am in the territories of those alive. Now let's talk about this for a minute. Territory implies inheritance, it implies ownership of land, it implies borders, right? It implies some, uh, a piece of land that is ours. And we know in the scriptural concept, land was always given as inheritance, And we know specifically the promised land is the most uh, pure example of that with the children of Israel. And that spiritually we're promised the promised land of eternal life with Christ here and hereafter. And so this territory that he's speaking of, he's saying, you've brought me into the promised land. You've brought me into the territories of those alive. Uh, I love that phrase because what he's saying is, my tribe are those who are spiritually alive. You've given me a place. Isn't it good to know you have a place? You know, um, without the body of Christ, we can be saved, but we we don't have a a full place with people until we're brought into that that body, that community relationship like we have here and so enjoy. And that's because we have brothers and sisters and those who are alive are now our companions in this walk. And he, when he says in the first part of the verse, I will walk about before the presence of I am. He's talking about a freedom of communion, of unbroken fellowship with God. It's Eden restored when Adam and Eve could walk in the cool of the day with their maker and commune as friend with friend. That has been restored in this vision that the psalmist has here. I will walk about before the presence of I am. In the territories of those alive. And that's not just in heaven. That's not just 
past the pearly gates. That is now, brothers and sisters. Remember, we have a people. God has a people, I should say. But it's our people. We have a place. It's a place with his body. And, and it's not just us. It's, uh, you heard Pastor Benny. It's those globally who are part of the fellowship of Christ for all eternity. Verse 10. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. It's a little bit confusing, but when you kind of dive into the Hebrew, it makes more sense. So let me read you another rendition here. I believed, even when I pronounced, I am utterly afflicted. He's saying, I believed, even when I said, I am utterly afflicted. Utterly meaning, um, I am afflicted beyond repair, beyond return. I'm not coming back from this. This is going to take me out. He's saying, I believed, even when I said that. And isn't that powerful, that God puts that kernel of faith, that, that mustard seed of faith in our hearts, and that even in our statements of despondency, there's faith in there. And the Lord knows that. He says, he continues in verse 10, excuse me, verse 11, I said in my haste, all men are liars. Hmm. It's a lot more dramatic in the Hebrew. He says, I said in my panic, every human is a liar. <laughs> I get emotional because I've given a great portion of my life to serving the generations behind us. And if there's any cry in my heart, it's so they know there's a God who never lies. We have such an embarrassing debacle presented before them every day of what it looks like to grow up, doesn't don't we? Not us, not us in this room, but what they see and digest via media and other ways. Everything, all, all the things, all the lies. Oh my goodness. Where is the truth? Truth is, as a concept, is scoffed at. Because they're so overwhelmed by everyone claiming, no one living, what they claim. Changing their stories repeatedly. I mean, how much have we been through that the last two years, right? And he's saying, I said in my panic, every human is a liar. And we can get to that point where we're so beat down by all the lies. And we say, is there any truth anymore? And it's, it's a trap we can't fall in, though. And... Solomon teaches us well in Ecclesiastes when he says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And he gives this despondent, honestly quite depressing book for the most part about the, the throes of depression we fall into when all we look at is the vanity of the carnal life. Now, we know from Romans 5 that to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so... What he's saying is, I, I got so caught up on the carnality that surrounded me, and it just seemed like every single person lied, that there was no truth to be found anymore. Um, sometimes we think that's a new phenomenon. <laughs> but this psalmist, all those centuries ago, felt the same way. There's probably a lot of betrayal behind that. There's probably a lot of um, hypocrisy. There's probably... Um, some pretty heartbreaking relational divides that happened that brought him to the point where he said that. And think of Jesus. Right after he gave the piece of bread to Judas. Think of Jesus as he's in Gethsemane and they're all passed out because they had too much wine. And he said, you couldn't pray with me one hour? So our Lord definitely knows what it's like to feel alone and that the truth has died all around him. But he said it was in a state of panic when he said this and that it wasn't reality because look at the next verse. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? And 
What shall I give back to I am for all his gracious acts toward me? And then he, he follows it up with some ideas. This is another, that word benefits there is really hard to translate. Gracious acts, they're, they're, um, loving kindness and goodness. There's all these words that we could plug in there from the English, but it's the only time it appears in Scripture. So he's saying, what the Lord has done for me is so good, it's beyond description. And I've been through all of these things, some pretty intense things. But what I want to do at the end of it all is say, the Lord has shown me so many benefits. Words fail to even describe how good and faithful he has been. But he does say this, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So he says, what will I render to the Lord? What can I give him back? What can I return to him? Did anyone ever give you a really nice gift? And you just felt like there's no way you could repay them, you know? Whether it was something tangible or intangible, you just felt like there wasn't, you know, how do I even repay this? And you knew you couldn't. Well, uh, obviously, the greatest example of that is the, the Father who gives good gifts to men and what he get, does for us. And what he's saying here is, you give me so much, Lord, can I offer you something? Can I just do something for you? And it, it stirs his heart and he realizes, I do have something I can give. And so do you and I. He says, I will take up the cup of salvation. And call upon the name of the Lord. See, the Lord has given me this cup of salvation figuratively. And I can take this that he's given me, this salvation he's poured into my heart. I can't offer that back to him. And say, Lord, you saved this. I'm giving this back to you to do whatever you will. And the cup of salvation is so symbolic, obviously, because this is the Seder. The four cups, right? There's so much symbolism here happening. The cup of salvation is lifted up as part of that very um, ritual. And he, this last night, again, he was with the disciples. He was raising up that cup of salvation. And in Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Right? And he knew in his heart it wasn't possible. But he knew he had to be honest with his father. But so what he did is like, Lord, it, it won't pass from me. And so what I'll do is I'll take it and offer it back to you. I'm not asking that you take it away from me or that we skip that step. But I'm asking you to just receive it back. I give you back this cup of suffering, this cup of, uh, excuse me, of, of salvation. And, the, and no metaphor is perfect, but I was thinking through the cup of salvation. And if it's a cup that's full of, of the salvation of God, that he pours out into us, Right? Think of it this way. When we offer that back up to him, isn't the prayer that he poured out in abundance through us to others so that that cup that runs over that David talks about in Psalm 23 is, is that cup of salvation that just bubbles over and, and others receive from that same salvation? Isn't that the ultimate on this side of eternity? And so the cup of salvation is a grand gift. It really is. It's vast what the Lord can do through the salvation that he offers humanity. And he's saying, I will give this back to you, Lord. All that you've done for me, I will lift this back to you and do with it what you will for the sake of others. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. And he said, I will not only give this salvation back to you as a surrender and a love offering, but I will say this. I will stand in the presence and the congregation of the righteous. I will stand with those who have also been redeemed and do show them by my acts of worship how much I love you, how much I want to live my life for you visibly. Um, I think baptism is a part of that, right? Um, it's been so wonderful to see all the baptisms here recently, and I think that baptism is an awesome show. Um, of our taking those vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. I think that's a, a, a beautiful New Testament illustration of that. Which goes into the next verse. Um, nothing is oddly placed in Scripture. So I encourage you, if you ever come into a, random, a verse that seems random in its placement, 
Um, there's a reason, right? And I, I poured over this and asked the Lord for some wisdom. He says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And here's my understanding of this passage. Giving up the cup of salvation back to the Lord is giving him everything that he's given us. And that's a volitional act of death, really, because it's saying, I give this back up to you, Lord. I'm surrendering everything back to you. And so there's this, this death, this denying of the flesh, this denying of ourselves that happens. And it's a, a death, a volitional death to what we want and our will is what Gethsemane represents. Gethsemane happens in our heart, sometimes multiple times throughout our journey, right? And we ha have these deeper levels of surrender where the Lord says, do you want to come? And we say, yes, Lord, take the cup, take the cup. And that's a precious thing to him. He takes that cup and he, he cherishes it and he does things with it. And your life and the lives of others because you've chosen to die to you. You've chosen to give up even that inheritance of salvation that he's given you. You've chosen to give it back to him. When I speak of giving it back, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we cast off our state of being saved. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying we're, we're giving back all that he's given us. We say, Lord, take it back. I, I give you back my life. Do what you want with it. And precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The meaning is also plain as the nose on our faces that when, when someone passes into eternity, it's a precious thing to the Lord when it's one of his children. Is it precious when it's someone who is not his child? No, it's not. It's tragic. It's heartbreaking. It's devastating. It's not precious. Though that soul is. Because it's too late then, you know. But he says it's precious in the sight of the Lord when I call my people home. Verse 16. O Lord, truly, I am your servant's. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. All right, let me ask you. Um, you know, one of the, I think, blights on human history is the slave trade you know, globally that's happened throughout the years in different countries, including ours. And what is the one thing that is so just visually offensive? You know, we see uh, maybe a slave market or slave ship um, type photo or, or painting or rendering, it's a human being bound, you know, bound in, in fetters and chains of some sort. It just offends the deepest part of who we are because we know that we're created to be free, right? And um, I was thinking about that when that last, look at that last word in this verse, he says bonds, you've loosed my bonds. But the very first part of the verse says, I am your servant. And this is that word play we're talking about. In Hebrew poetry, he's saying, you have loosed my bonds, but I have been set free to be captivated by you. And that in captivation to Christ, we find true freedom and bonds of love and cords of love that he's bound us with to himself. We find our freedom. See, all those times the enemy lied to us and we felt like coming under the bonds of Jesus, the bonds of love that he reaches out to us, that that would be losing our freedom. And he's saying all along, no, I found my freedom. You broke my bonds when I became enslaved to your love. Amen? And there's also history to this. He said, I am the servant, the son of your maidservant. How messianic is that? I mean, it's almost quoting the very word that Mary used when she said, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. And so... This is such a messianic chapter in so many ways. And we, we see Jesus and, and Mary depicted here. Um, and Mary, of course, we don't worship her, revere her above other, other humans in an inappropriate way. But we do revere her because uh, the Lord does. And because the Lord chose to bring the, our Messiah through her. And he says, I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. There's history to this. I was brought into this world by someone who wanted me to live for you. And uh, if you're like me and you had a godly mother, this is very literally true. Uh, my mother is a maidservant of the Lord that really birthed me in the kingdom in so many ways. 
her testimony and influence in my life. Many of you could say the same, I'm sure, and many of you may say something different about your biological mother, but I guarantee you, each one of you, there was a maidservant, there was a manservant somewhere that birthed you into the kingdom through his or her prayers and influence. So there's history to your walk with God that predates even you, right? And he says, God, this, this awesome thing you've done, this salvation that you've done, you've loosed my bonds. And now, verse 17, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We'll call upon the name of the Lord. Sacrifice of thanksgiving, sacrifice of praise is a phrase that we see a lot in the Psalms. And we see, again, he's calling out to God. And I think this is what he's saying. Based on the context and what we've read about so far in this chapter, he's saying it is a sacrifice sometimes to give thanks. It is not the easiest thing to do. I want to do everything but give thanks. I want to give you a list of, of needs and burdens that are heavy on my heart. I want to tune out everything serious because um, I just want to do what I want to do. I don't want to talk to you at all. Or maybe it's I want to pray, Lord, but I want to pray about specific things or ask you for certain things that I need. And he's saying, I'm sacrificing all of that and I'm just worshiping you. I'm giving you thanks. You know, whatever's happening all around me, all the people that are the liars that surround me, all of the, the darkness and the death that threaten to entangle me, even in all that, in spite of all of that, and I would even dare say because of all of that, I offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is real thanksgiving when it costs us something, right? Um, there's so many times that... Um, we can become flippant without meaning to in our walk with Jesus. And um, it's those things that um, bring us close to him. And brothers and sisters, there's two things. There's two things throughout the psalm and throughout scripture and throughout our faith as believers. There's two things that are guaranteed us in our walk with Jesus in this side of eternity. And that's salvation by his wonderful grace and it's suffering to bind us to his heart. Salvation and suffering are guaranteed each of us. It's a hard pill to swallow, especially when we would rather believe other things about the suffering part. Right? We want the first part of that. We want to skip the last part. And there's even those who say that because we're saved, we no longer have the suffering. I, <laughs> do you ever wonder how that theology lasts? <laughs> like, how, how does it? You know what I mean? Like, how do you last even a year believing that? <laughs> because, um, you know, we're, we're cumbered about by so many things in this life. And they're not all dramatic and, and intense suffering. Some of them are minor, but there's so many things that just prove to us that we will suffer in this life. As Jesus said, we will. But he's saying, even then, I'm going to thank you. And I would say that we know that we've gotten a glimpse of the heart of God when we thank him for the suffering. We don't pretend that we want to go through it. We don't pretend that it's fun. We don't pretend we would ask for it all over again. Although some of you have told me that very thing. I would go through it all over again because of what the Lord did through this suffering, right? But he says, if we can give thanks in the suffering, that's a true sacrifice that pleases the Lord. Verse 18, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. We're now part of the Lord's house. And I love the way Peter talks about how we are living stones built up on the foundation stone of Christ himself. We are part of that new temple spiritually that he's built. And so we have that place. We are the part of the house of God ourselves. And he says, in the house of God, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of your Jerusalem, which is God's city, we know, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Pay my vows is kind of cryptic language for us today, right? It doesn't, the meaning doesn't make itself very apparent. Well, all it means is 
he was going to do the, um, the obligatory and the optional sacrifices to, Jesus, to the Lord at the temple. He was going to go and, and he was going to sing the songs, of the, the songs of Scripture of their faith. He was going to do exactly what they did that night and, and participate in the feasts like the Seder. All this is paying his vows in the presence of God's congregation. He says, I will practice my faith, not because it's something special for me, but because it's the faith of, of Christ, because it is something that he has called me into. This cup of salvation brings with it an obligation of sorts to participate in something bigger than us, participate in the people of God, the house of God, the church of God universal. And it goes beyond the four walls of this church. It's, it's a fellowship that, that began in Acts and will continue to eternity, right? It's everyone who has come to Christ. And he says, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of your Jerusalem, hallelujah. So let's circle back when we started looking at this text together tonight. We saw that it started with, I love the Lord, and it ends with, hallelujah. There's a whole lot in between. What I love is how death is a theme that he repeats. Look at verse 3 again. The pains of death surrounded me. The pains of Sheol laid hold of me. And then skip down to verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Do you see what happened there? Something that looked like it was going to be the end of him, the destruction of him, the overwhelming of him, was actually something precious and used by God. Something that he could give praise to the Lord for later. God redefines everything for you and I. So I encourage you in closing tonight, if there's some definitions that have gotten muddy along the way of the fellowship that we're really a part of, maybe, or that maybe we're seeing that all men are liars and it's just weighing us down. Or maybe we're thinking uh, some of these discouraging things are going through some of these struggles or, or seeing those who are feeling the pangs of the shackles of, of death or the onslaught of hell. Remember, God redefines all this. And he says, all this death that you think you're experiencing because we live in a carnal and broken world is precious to me because it forms something Precious in the hearts of my people. It draws me close to their heart and them to my heart. And as Jesus went into the garden of Gethsemane that night with the verses of this psalm ringing through the ears and the minds and the hearts of him and his disciples. It's so good to know that the Father in heaven looked down So that's my son, and that's precious. This death he's about to, to die is precious. And he's looking down at you tonight and saying, whatever it is that maybe you're called to go through, it brings a death to something in you. It's precious to him because of the life it brings for you and for others. So let the Lord redefine everything that we are tonight, and so that we see, we can offer that full-hearted sacrifice of thanksgiving and say, God, I love you, and I praise you. This cup of salvation that you've given me is wonderful. I will not forget all your benefits. Amen? All right. We're going to um, close with a song, so um, let's stand together, and um, as Pastor Dave comes up, I'd like to just Pray over you and over this word, and then um, we'll close with song and a prayer as well.